the African American Legend series highlights the accomplishments of blacks in areas as varied as politics, sports, aviation, business, literature, and theater. We will explore how African Americans have succeeded in areas where they've been previously excluded because of segregation, racism, and lack of opportunity. I'm your host, Dr. Roscoe C. Brown, Jr., and with us today is Woody King, Jr., the founder of the New Federal Theater that's celebrating his 35th anniversary on February 13th. I, I can't wait. <laughs> I can't, can't wait. wait. <laughs> you know, when I started off, I thought I'd be around a couple of years, you know, but then 10 years went past, 15, 20, 25. And now you're producing your son's work. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I'm producing my son's work who wasn't even born then. Tell us about how New Federal Theater started. Okay, well... New Federal Theater started uh, in 1970, and it started as an outgrowth of a program I was working with uh, in the anti-poverty movement called Mobilization for Youth, mm -hmm. which was down on the Lower East Side. Mm -hmm. And we trained young people in dance, uh, music, theater, filmmaking, and fine arts. And we only trained them. And so as a result of that, the director of the Mobilization for Youth got offered a job at Henry Street as the director. So he asked me to come along with him. And in coming along with him, he said, now what do you want to do? I said, I would like to start a theater so these people that we've trained would have a place to work. And that's how it started. Now at that time, the Negro Ensemble Company. Had, uh, it was three years it was, old. It was then. three years old, and we're going to talk a little about that later. You're uh -huh. honoring Doug, Doug Turner Ward, Ward, who helped to found that. Yeah. And this was really the height of the Zeiskis in the black theater movement. People right. were thinking about theater, Barbara Antier, uh, what is it? New Lafayette. New Lafayette, uh, Roger Furman, Furman and, and, and uh, Hazel oh, Bryan, yeah, and Ernie McClintock. Yeah. I mean, it was a fervent time. Mm -hmm. The 60s, you understand, was an unbelievable fervent time with mm -hmm. activity mm -hmm. and excitement. And uh, the plays were about uh, overcoming mm -hmm. uh, this racist system mm -hmm. and joining the civil rights movement mm -hmm. and speaking out. <coughs> and so out of that movement, these theaters were formed to make their own statement. Mm -hmm. And, and you're about the only one who survived. Well, the National Black Theater survived. The National Black Theater is really trying hard, and it is surviving. Uh, the Billy Holiday Theater, theater in Brooklyn, Brooklyn. Mm -hmm. it, and the Black Spectrum yeah. Theater in, in Queens. Uh, Queens. Yeah. So these theaters are really out there, you know, striving. But I think along with the National Black Theater, the New Federal Theater is mm -hmm. uh, one of the oldest. Now, you have done so. How many plays have you done in New Federal Theater? Oh, uh, God, maybe two, three hundred uh, over these 35 years. And about 95% of those plays were new plays by new writers. Mm -hmm. And these plays, uh, for our first 10 or 12 years, every play, uh, every season, we had a huge hit. Mm -hmm. And that hit would go all over the world, you know. Uh, plays like Black Girl by mm -hmm. J.E. Franklin. Mm -hmm. Uh, Ed Bullins in New England Winters, mm -hmm. uh, Ron Milner's What the Wine, Wine Cellars Cellar. Buy, yeah. um, Intozaki Shange's yeah. uh, For Colored Girls Who Considered Suicide When the Rainbow is Enough. And it goes on and on to the current mm -hmm. uh, past two or three years where we did a play called The Trial, A One mm -hmm. Short Sighted Black Woman. Mm -hmm. And it traces our, our lineage from Africa into the Americas mm -hmm. and into slavery and where we are mm -hmm. currently. And uh, again, uh, what we're exploring is uh, our roots to Africa. And that's what we've been working on in the last two seasons. Great Men of Gospel mm -hmm. is uh, exactly that. Tracing uh, gospel music mm -hmm. out of Africa through the Mill Passage and the slave mm -hmm. ships to the South, using those slave songs as a guiding light mm -hmm. to the Underground Railroad, to freedom in the North mm -hmm. and into Canada, and to uh, the current Edward Hawkins singers. You were from Detroit. Yes. And when you were a teenager, you had a group, a rock group. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Tell us about that. Okay. Okay. <laughs> um, when I was uh, uh, very, very young in Detroit, uh, every the only way to get out of the ghetto, uh, the ghettos that we were uh, relegated mm -hmm. to, in a sense, was to either be a boxer, mm -hmm. Joe Lewis was our hero, mm -hmm. or be a singer, mm -hmm. or be some sort of hustler or pimp or whatever, mm -hmm. you know. And uh, of course, 
having this inclination for art, I drifted towards uh, rhythm and blues, uh, doo-wop music. And I've written extensively about it. But uh, we had a, a, a rhythm and glue, uh, blues group. We made a record in the hallway. And it was a hit in Detroit. <laughs> we never received any royalties. We don't know, we don't know what happened uh, to uh, uh, the producer who recorded us. But it was uh, kind of a big hit in the mid '50s. But and I was, of course, Detroit is Motown. Detroit, <laughs> Motown hadn't started there. Hadn't started there. Hadn't started there. You know. There. Right. There, you know. Uh, but uh, that's what we were all doing then. You know, I went to school with Smokey Robinson mm -hmm. and Bobby Rogers and a lot of the Miracles. You know, mm -hmm. so it was like uh, everyone was singing. Yeah. Everyone. You know, that was the way out. You know, mm -hmm. it's almost like. They say if you go into uh, Hollywood now, everyone has written a screenplay. Yeah. The cab driver, <laughs> the waiter. <laughs> yeah. uh, would you read my screenplay? <laughs> but back then, would you listen to my yeah. music? You know, and Barry Gordy uh, and the Motown people broke through mm -hmm. uh, because he had the uh, family structure that backed him. Mm -hmm. A lot of us did not have that. Mm -hmm. On February thirteenth, two o five. You're going to have this great 35th anniversary. Yes. And it reads like the Hall of Fame of Black Theater. Yeah. Tell us about that. <laughs> well, uh, I don't know if you uh, remember our 30th anniversary. We had Sidney Poitier, Danny Glover, Cecily, Ruby D. Uh, I mean, we had everybody. Charles Dutton. People came in from South Africa, from all over the world to help, help us celebrate our 30th anniversary. So we said, we can't do this every year. We can only do this every five or six years. And so what happened is, you know, you stand in the back of the theater, you know, you hear Sidney Poitier or Danny Glover talking about their relationship with me. Mm -hmm. And the people in the audience, they say, oh, wow. They, they don't know that's over 30 years, yeah. you know. <laughs> it's compressed that evening into one uh, uh, compressed kind of time. They think, oh, I know Sidney. I mean, you know so-and-so-and-so. Mm -hmm. -and -so -and -so. Like, you know Dr. Roscoe mm -hmm. Brown, but we, we go 30 years mm -hmm. back, right? So... In our 35th anniversary, uh, which we are going to do at Town Hall here in New York, February 13th, 2005, mm -hmm. we're going to honor uh, Ed Bullins, the great Mickey Grant, mm -hmm. uh, George C. Wolfe, the Broadway cast of A Raisin in the Sun with Puff Combs, because it brought more black people to Broadway than mm -hmm. any other uh, mm -hmm. black play in the history of Broadway. Mm -hmm. And we're going to honor... Theater Development Fund, mm -hmm. and in that Theater Development Fund, they've given us uh, ticket subsidies for 25 yeah. or 30 years. But the highlight of the evening is we're going to roast and toast Douglas Turner Ward. And Douglas Turner Ward says, okay, it's cool with me. I, uh, if people want to roast me, remember, I have the last word as a person <laughs> being roasted, so I would get back at them. Uh, so that's what we're going to do. And um, Douglas Turner Ward uh, uh, and uh, the cast of A Raisin in the Sun um, uh, was in Detroit in 1960, 61. That was before I came. And I would stand at the stage door and wait for them to come out. And I would walk him and Robert Hooks all the way to their hotel, talking about I want to come to New York. Mm -hmm. I want to come to New York. And Doug said something that was so profound. He said... Uh, you got to stop talking about it and just do it. Just do it. That <laughs> sounds like that. <laughs> That's right. Doug, you know, so uh, we're going to roast and toast mm -hmm. him. Robert Hooks is coming in from L.A. to uh, say a few words about him. Hattie Winston, who was uh, with the Negro Ensemble. And uh, R Robert Hooks uh, is going to talk a little bit about Doug before the NEC. Mm -hmm. And then there will be a host of people talking about him during the NEC. And uh, I'm looking forward to it. And we have... Our, our a great sculpture. Uh, I don't know if you know him, but I think you know everybody. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Named Otto Niels. Mm -hmm, yeah. Otto mm -hmm. Niels is going to make us these statuettes that we give to the That's beautiful. artists. That's really beautiful. You know, and they are awesome, Dr. Brown. They mm -hmm. are awesome. You know, and uh, uh, somehow we discovered Otto, Otto Niels uh, by accident mm -hmm. by looking in some magazine. You know, say, oh wow, he lives in Brooklyn, mm -hmm. and. Uh, the late Wayne Grice mm -hmm. took us to him, mm -hmm. and he said, yeah, I'll do that for you. So it's, it's, it's an awesome experience. Now, looking at black theater over 30 years, mm -hmm. 50 years, the uh, civil rights movement, of course, was the catalyst to opening the door. 
many of the foundations provided funds, many of the government agencies like Mobilization for Youth provided funds, and young black people who were going through the Civil Rights Movement said, this is our opportunity to express ourselves. Mm -hmm. And Negro Ensemble Company <coughs> was probably the first of these first companies to get things going with the Ford Foundation money, and I had the privilege to serve as a chair for many years and work on the various projects which was hard to keep up because every time you produce a hit play, it goes all over the country, all over the world, but it costs money. Mm -hmm. And the National Endowment for the Arts and New York State Council, all those groups kept giving money, but it wasn't enough. Mm -hmm. So as a result, when we came down to it, we said we can't continue this way. Now, what did you do to keep New Federal Theater moving along in the same climate? Okay, what we tried to do was have an unbelievable uh, uh, focused, if you will, uh, producing unit. Our producing unit will produce a play if it's four, five, six characters. We won't do a play with 20 characters if we don't have the yeah. money to pay the people. Yeah. Uh, I, I learned early on in uh, theater school that... Uh, you c if you don't have the money in hand, do not do the play. Don't count on the box office because that's the very time it will snow and mm -hmm. nothing will come in. Mm -hmm. If you don't have the grant, uh, if you don't have the uh, funds, don't do the play. Don't do it on a wing mm -hmm. and a prayer. Mm -hmm. Don't do it on a promise. And I think that's what uh, helped New Federal Theater survive all these years. And also, we try to keep a very stream line uh, staff. It's me as the producer and director, a company manager, uh, secretary, and we only hire people when the play is on. Mm -hmm. uh, when the play is on, we'll bring in a press agent, we'll bring in the production manager, we'll bring in the actors, directors, and everybody, and we pay them in that instance. But we will not have a group of actors or technicians mm -hmm. sitting around getting paid when nothing is happening. Mm -hmm. The other problem with uh, uh, theater is if you own a building, okay, and you only do four plays a year, what happens to that building <laughs> those other times because the rent must be paid even though you're not doing anything? And so that eats up a lot of uh, income. I'm, I'm smiling because that's what we experienced <laughs> with NEC. <laughs> okay. Uh, so that, that, that was something I learned earlier from having run a theater in Detroit. Mm -hmm. Uh, the other uh, uh, aspect of it is, like, if you do not have the money, and I keep saying this, I keep getting back to this, to pay an actor uh, what he is asking, don't hire that actor. You, you must be able to say, this is what I can pay you within the union structure. Now, you go to the union and say, this is what I can pay. Mm -hmm. And uh, most of the time, the union and the actor will agree. Mm -hmm. Uh, the other uh, uh, thing about black theater is, and I know uh, this will be very controversial, but I'm going to say it anyway, uh, the black theater cannot uh, support black artists in the uh, tradition that white theaters can support their artists. We don't have the uh, uh, support from, say, the top 100 black businesses. We don't have the the, the support from the 100 black businessmen or 100 black businesswomen yet. And that is something we are always trying to encourage. And uh, as the director of a theater company, I must find other means of income. I will teach somewhere. I will give lectures. I will direct in Europe or direct in L.A. I direct at the regional theaters one or two shows a year. Because the theater cannot... Uh, support mm -hmm. uh, uh, my uh, uh, way of living. <laughs> See, you, you sound like a very wise man, and wisdom comes with age and <laughs> as from well experience, as with, right. well as with, with genius. Mm -hmm. But I was reading in the New York Times the other day of how plays in general and um, dramas are not really staying on Broadway. 
for the very reasons that you talked about. Mm -hmm. The cost of the actors, uh, doing a lot of four and three and five character plays. Right. And these are people who have a, a million dollars to put into a play. Right. Uh, most recently, August Wilson's new play, Gems of the Ocean, has come to Broadway. And again, the question is, how do you keep the audience going, particularly when it's a black play? Uh, you have many white uh, theater goers, but then the question is, how do you make it possible for many people from the African American community to come, and, and you've done this, you go to the churches, you go to the colleges, and get them out. Uh, so much so, it, it is really very difficult for yeah. a black play to sustain itself on Broadway. Right. But fortunately, you have the new Federal Theater at Henry Street, which is a smaller venue, and you're able to work in the community right. much better. I know you have the churches coming and the schools coming, and that really does help. That helps tremendously. Because uh, we've had some great black plays, mm -hmm. and many of them, some of them gone to Raising the Sun, probably the, the greatest. Right. But we've had uh, River Niger, and we've had Charles Fuller's plays. The and Soldier's plays. Soldier, yeah. And so on. Now, I know this is George C. Wolfe, whom you honor, yeah. has been doing work at the uh, Shakespeare Theater with, uh, with Pap. Mm -hmm. Now, I believe he's moving on. Is that correct? Yes. Uh, George C. Wolfe uh, changed the um, uh, audience complexion at the public. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you go to the New York Shakespeare Festival Public Theater, you will see an, this mixture of blacks, Asian, Latinos, mm -hmm. whites, everybody coming in because his repertory of theater mm -hmm. uh, is like that. Mm -hmm. And George C. Wolfe is also an artist. Mm -hmm. uh, George C. Wolfe is probably one of the best directors in America. Mm -hmm. uh, however, what's so interesting, he had to start writing in order to direct mm -hmm. his work. I, I right? that, yeah. And so uh, uh, what, what I always find fascinating is uh, uh, with George C. Wolfe is you know, his earlier plays had 15, 20 characters, mm -hmm. you know. And then he wrote a play called The Colored Museum yeah, yeah. with seven to eight characters. It was done all over, mm -hmm. you know. Then he wrote a Zora Neale Hurston piece. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's, it, it, it's coming to know this New York scene. Mm -hmm. It's almost like a, a university. A kid comes in as a freshman mm -hmm. four years later. Mm -hmm. When he get ready to go, mm -hmm. he knows everything, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> but it's time to go. Mm -hmm. A new kid comes in. Mm -hmm. Same with the theater. I think uh, uh, George uh, is going on to direct films. Mm -hmm. I know he has a film coming out called Lackawanna Blues mm -hmm. um, based on a play by Ruben Santiago Hudson, mm -hmm. who ironically yeah. is appearing in Gem of the Ocean. Mm -hmm. Well, one of the things that you find is the black theater community is really very small. Yes. There are a lot of young people who want to get into it, but the ones who stay, it's a relatively small group of folks. It's very small. And now, what, what impact has Hollywood had on black theater? Well, I mean, Hollywood uh, is the ultimate goal where you figure, uh, like, say, you go back to the 30s, 40s, and 50s. If you were in a hit play in New York, then you know that play was going to be made into a film. You know the actors in it was going to go to Hollywood. Mm -hmm. That changed in the late 60s. Okay, people start going to film school. So they come out of film school and go to Hollywood. <laughs> it was, so Broadway was no longer mm -hmm. uh, uh, the embryonic place where this stuff was developed. Um, so what happened is a whole new crop of young actors, unbelievably dedicated and brilliant and brilliant. Uh, Lloyd Richards had a lot to do with mm -hmm. the training of a lot of them. Uh, came out, like uh, like the Angela Bassett's of the world, Lawrence Fishburne, who came out of the New Federal Theater, mm -hmm. or uh, uh, Denzel Washington, mm -hmm. who did a lot of work at the New Federal Theater, Morgan Freeman, who did a lot of work at the New Federal Theater, Samuel Jackson, who did a lot of work at the New Federal Theater, and the Negro Ensemble Company. And uh, out of that group of people, Hollywood movies sort of like became their a uh, place of unbelievable wealth. The Negro Ensemble Company sent people into the television world, mm -hmm. and you name it, Denise Nicholas, uh, Robert Hooks, uh, just so many, Esther Roll, you know, mm -hmm. just so many of the um, uh, artists who uh, worked at the Negro Ensemble went into television and became mainstays of television. So if you look at television as Hollywood, 
and the film industry is Hollywood. What Hollywood simply waits and do is say, okay, this is a greatly trained person. Mm -hmm. I can use them. Mm -hmm. They can come in here and do these lines in the day and do mm -hmm. all this stuff. Mm -hmm. But they, do, they really don't give anything back to the theaters that developed them. You do. I don't give anything back because I, they come and work with us That's and it. get their training and go on. Mm -hmm. They don't necessarily well, come back. What about the new generation of actors? Where do you get them from? How do you Out of colleges and universities, mm -hmm. they come in mm -hmm. from, uh, like, professors mm -hmm. will say, look, I got a, a young uh, brother who's graduating. He's coming to New York. Mm -hmm. And that professor might be Dr. Lundina Thomas. Mm -hmm. uh, it might be uh, Eileen Morris from Houston. Uh, and they keep coming into New York, and they want places to get started. Mm -hmm. And they will start with New Federal Theater, or they will start with National Black Theater, or they will start with Black Spectrum or Billie Holiday. And we give them that, uh, that safety net. Mm -hmm. You know, you got to play leads and plays and play leads before you have this unbelievable assurity that I know what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. And then they can go on to television and go on into film. Mm -hmm. Today in Black Theater, what is the basic message we are trying to develop? At one time, it was freedom. We are fighting for our freedom. At another time, it was our roots in Africa. What are we talking about now in the themes of black theater? Well, I keep seeing the themes that uh, appear and reappear as a sort of like African continuum. Mm -hmm. um, this African continuum you will see in August Wilson's Gem of the Ocean. Mm -hmm. uh, you will see it in The Trial, mm -hmm. One Short-Sighted Black Woman versus Mammy Louise and Sabrina May. This continuum is uh, uh, both uh, cultural, spiritual, and uh, kind of a memory, if mm -hmm. you will. Historical memory. Uh, historical memory. And uh, it uh, emanates out of uh, this belief that if you are in one of the whitest countries in the world, you can be in Norway, mm -hmm. and uh, or a Norwegian country, or wherever, and a black person across a room, and if you and that black person in a room, before the evening is over, you all are going to, my magnet will bring you all together. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter if he's the president of a country or whatever, that magnet brings you together. There's a commonality, mm -hmm. there's a common history, there's a common uh, understanding, if you will. Um, and uh, I think that is what black theater uh, has been exploring and is exploring. And I think uh, it is also about family. Uh, family is being, I know this is my theme, and most theaters are run by, uh, uh, themed by the person who runs it. And it's a, usually about a family uh, coming together after some crisis. Mm -hmm. And this family comes together out of a uh, unbelievable love of each other and some understanding that uh, they did not have before the play started. Mm -hmm. And that understanding is uh, a better a way of uh, understanding the father, the mother, the uncle, the cousin, or whoever. And by, uh, by that understanding, they are closer and therefore stronger. Where do we get the next Woody Kings? Well, um, as always, uh, with me and I think with Doug and uh, Ed Bullins and George C. Wolf, we are always mentoring two or three people at the same time. Uh, I mentor uh, uh, a young brother out of Detroit named Karamu Kush, mm -hmm. and uh, I really like his work. Another young brother out of uh, an actor out of uh, Augusta named Jay Jones, and uh, I really like this young sister who came from the West Coast, and she just walked into my office, you know, and I said, wow, it was something mm -hmm. about her. Her name is Donita Gray, and, uh, we, you know, we just call each other. She might be 24 years old, you know, and she just calls, I just got back from Oregon. Oh, I'm going to be going to Oregon doing, guess what? Mm -hmm. The nosy neighbor and a raising the son. I said, but you're only 24 years old. The nosy neighbor's supposed to be 40. She said, but don't tell him. <laughs> <laughs> uh, for the audience, uh, where's the phone number? Where's the phone number where they can follow up on this February 13th? Okay, Fe February 13th, I think uh, uh, the best number to call is our events coordinator, yeah. and that's Lorelei Enterprises mm -hmm. at 212 838 two six six 
zero. Okay, we'll have it on the super so that you'll okay. be able to see it. Uh, Woody, I want to thank you for coming and talking with us. And, you know, we've known each other forever. Never, right. And to <laughs> think that the Negro Ensemble Company, Doug Ward's being honored, to think that the new Federal Theater is 35 years old. And I really hope that this event helps to inspire other African Americans who are interested in drama, theater, and our culture. I do too. I think it will. Thank you for being with us on African American Legends today, Woody King Jr.